I grew up in Lubbock, Texas. I'm the oldest of three. My father was a CPA and my mother a school teacher and enjoyed airplanes as well as cars and I started to win contests with models that I built. Age 13, I entered the General Motors Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild contest. And that contest was for building model cars, again from scratch. The contest was a wonderful PR vehicle for General Motors, uh, giving youth a, a chance to learn about cars and how to build cars and even the uh, awards were very generous. I won the regional awards, which were the Western States, four years in a row, and the award was two weeks in Detroit, uh, touring the factories and hobnobbing with the GM brass, and vivid recall, which made a tremendous impression was going up on an elevator to that 13th floor and when the doors opened there in a purple spotlight was Le Sabre, the General Motors show car. And it was about two feet tall. And standing behind it in that purple light was Harley Earl, who was about eight feet tall. He in fact was a capable designer himself. He started out in a uh, Hollywood custom building shop and later evolved uh, the first, the absolute first, styling sections of the Detroit car makers. He began what became a profession, a car stylist. Again, imagine the impression on a 13-year-old and that inspired inspired me and uh, led me to want to be a car designer. And I took full advantage of all of that after the four regional awards. Then I won the national award scholarship. The Fisher Body Craftsman Skilled Model, of course, was all hand built. And even the one that won the scholarship was carved from a big block of wood and even not having all the professional techniques the tail lights were carved from toothbrush handles the windows an aluminum based uh, phonograph record cut to fit into windows and even the license plate number was cut from a life magazine cover which showed the date of the magazine but that became the license plate my ultimate ambition was to become a car designer, so uh, by then I knew about Art Center. Art Center was the school where most of the leading designers were educated. So I had the scholarship from the contest, the Fisher Buddy Craftsman Guild, but I also won a motor trend contest and I managed to get a Ford scholarship, was able to use my scholarships to go to Art Center. At Art Center, the, at that time, there were a great number of uh, returning war vets on the GI Bill. So, the Japanese at that time had also become very conscious of styling after their entry into this market with Toyota. So they began to send uh, people to Art Center for training to be Japanese car designers. And therefore, even while making my top grades 
in my fourth semester, I also was assigned to be an instructor to most of these people who were much older than I was. So it took a little for them to become accustomed to having this kid being their instructor. Ford was hiring new designers. They sent Alex Tremulus to interview and select people for hiring. And I, again, I had not finished, but I sneaked into the interviews and Tremulus wanted to hire me. And I told him, I'm sorry, but it'll have to wait because I have to have my degree. And he then proceeded to go to the head of the school, who was a noted hard nose, and managed to talk him into giving me my degree with great distinction. Alex Tremulus, who was head of advanced design and who uh, indoctrinated all the new designers, took a liking to me and gave me opportunities to do things that were not made available to other people just beginning. I did uh, some 3 8 scale models, which are, that scale is about four and a half, five feet long. And I had been doing, uh, rather than advanced car ideas, I was doing even more futuristic kinds of things. So one of those models that I did was called, I called it the Nucleon, and it was the whole idea of atomic power 60 years ago was not considered that outrageous uh, because at atomic power was then being thought of for various uses before the stigma of all the uh, meltdowns and the problems. About that time, the Marine Corps was exploring a ducted fan. I saw a newsreel in which there was a engineering prototype of a flying platform using a ducted fan. It was not successful, finally. They finally dropped the idea. And uh, I, though, decided I, wanted, I would use that ducted fan premise for a flying car. I built uh, another model, and I called it the Volante. The Secret Door. Hello, everyone. This is Jack Douglas. This doorway that we see is one of the most closely guarded doorways in America. Few doorways outside of Washington are harder to crash. It happens to be the entrance to the styling center of an automobile manufacturer, the Ford Motor Company at Dearborn, Michigan. Behind the secret door lay plans for nothing less than the world's first mass-produced flying car. The Volante conceivably would be powered by three sets of rotor blades arranged in a triangular pattern. Forty years on and still dreaming, the Volante's designer, Jim Powers. In Los Angeles, where I live, uh, the traffic may stack up for hours, and uh, you could simply go above all that, look down on them, and smile. At the same time, I was doing uh, more conventional automobile proposals, including one that I called the Palomar, which had a sliding rear compartment roof. The rear half of the roof slid back on tracks. The name Palomar, of course, was inspired by the, the uh, Palomar telescopes with its sliding opening roof. Uh, and at, again, at the same time, working on uh, uh, other more 
timely things rather than far out into the future ideas. But I also started working on illustrations of what I said were for the year 2000. So I was doing projections 50 years ahead, back in the 50s. By that time, Tremulus, he had gotten into trouble because of his advocacies of streamlining aerodynamics, because he wanted to test things in wind tunnels and uh, change things to be aerodynamic. So he, in fact, unfortunately got demoted and a retired Army Colonel, Bob McGuire, took over advanced styling. He saw the things that I was doing and called those a waste of time. So he forbade me to do any of those things and do more current kinds of ideas. So being me, I started doing them at night after hours so that he really didn't have anything to say about it because I'd put them away during the day. But one night, George Walker, who was the VP, head of styling, came through and saw these things and they caught his eye and he then endorsed what I was doing so I was able to do it out in the open again. And Ford published uh, I finally did 12 of those major illustrations. Ford published a, uh, a book using those, a little uh, soft cover book. Ford then began to send those things to newspapers and television and radio to show that Ford was doing experimental things. And there were even newspaper stories that said Ford is developing atomic cars and Ford works on flying cars. All of these things, these far-fetched things that I was doing, Ford used them for PR. They then were in the Smithsonian for about six years. The illustrations and the models were in the, in the Smithsonian Institute. And they are still, the, the models are still owned by the Henry Ford Museum and the Nucleon had been on display all these 50 years. Uh, and even uh, four years ago, the Peterson Automotive Museum got them on loan and showed them in the Peterson Museum. At Ford, I uh, worked on advanced concepts uh, of various sorts. Uh, the uh, some show cars and ultimately into the Thunderbird studio where I worked for the head of the studio at that time was Bill Boyer. Uh, he was nice guy, but he was one of those people who, again, like my major inclinations were to want to do everything. Well, he wanted to do everything in the studio. And uh, so the by then we were working on the 61 Thunderbird proposals. And he was having great difficulty in coming up with something that was acceptable. So there was even a possibility of facelifting the 60 Thunderbird, which was known as the Square Bird. Management still felt they needed a new body style because that Square Bird began in 58 and the normal body cycle then was no more than three years before you had a new uh, design for the particular body. So Boyer, he, he, he was very good to me and he recognized my ability, uh, but he 
still wanted to do everything himself, uh, but the time was running out for decision making for 61. The uh, major show was scheduled and he was still experimenting with different kinds of ideas on clay models, full-size clay models, and really didn't come up with anything that they would accept, that management would accept. So the last straw was this deadline show to determine the direction. And for that prior week, he was still working on a full-size clay model. But because he was having problems, he grudgingly allowed me to work on the other side of that clay model. Now, with the show, the next day, he this is a show for top management, just, just final decision. His design was still pretty much uh, unresolved, but he gave instructions to his modelers what he thought they should do after hours to keep preparing for the show. On my side, uh, the models, modelers, the sculptors, normally would not allow the designers to scrape on the clay or shape the clay. You could mark the clay with your ideas and things, but not do the carving. But they liked me, and so with this sympathetic crew of modelers, we spent the night, the entire night, working on my side. Well, the next morning when people came, we were still working. But they finally hauled the model away to the showroom. And in that show where the model that I've just described, plus Elwood Inkle's model. I told you earlier that Elwood did counter proposals and his proposal was there in the show. So the outcome of the show was that my design was chosen to be the 1961 Thunderbird. Uh, it was in fact later modified. I had uh, back at the time, uh, uh, fins were uh, certainly the thing, and uh, I had some good-sized fins back on the rear quarters. But uh, as engineering began to work with styling for development for production, the fins were too costly and they were removed. But Otherwise, the design stayed basically the way that I had done it. As the car was further developed for production, uh, Boyer did, in fact, uh, add his touches, which was, he fattened it up a little bit. So uh, that was his taste. He made it a little fuller and uh, heavier looking than what I had done. I'm here with Jim Powers. And this is quite an event today. Yes, it's a wonderful show. And what did you bring to the Concord today? This 1961 Thunderbird. I understand you were involved with the design of this car. Uh, 60 years ago, I did the original clay model that eventually became this car. This car was a complete departure from previous Thunderbirds, and many people felt that it was too radical. In fact, it got the uh, nickname of being the Rocket Bird. Along with the, the whole Rocket Bird concept, you can see the tail lights and bumper combination are these huge blast tubes. And again, very radical, and nothing like that had ever been done before on a production car. And when they light up, it's certainly very dramatic to see the red rocket blast come from the taillights. As I mentioned before, this car was considered very radical. And if you see the 1960 Thunderbird, you can see the great difference 
from 1960 to this 1961. After that, I was transferred to the Ford studio where I did 3 8 scale clay model uh, down in the production, pre production section of the Ford studio, which later became the 1963 Ford Galaxy. So those were the two cars that I had begun the initial concepts. I imagine that I was a studio manager, the youngest studio manager ever, and as such uh, there was a time when Henry Ford II, we called him HF2, would come through uh, for a guided tour with Iacocca, and Iacocca had this very intense machine gun delivery, and it was just pop, 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 and uh, Iacocca brought Mr. Ford into my studio. Old oh, Ford was, he was with his thumbs in his belt, and Iacocca woke up to the fact, and he said, he grabbed him by the lapels, I'm talking to you. Well. It was not long after that that Iacocca was gone. I'm sure there were other instances of, of similar conflict, but uh, Iacocca was uh, not compatible with Mr. Ford. When I first went to Ford, styling was under engineering and a name that you might recognize, Earl Steele McPherson, as in Strutz. He was vice president of engineering and that incorporated styling. Styling was not separate. George Walker came to Ford as a consultant and brought Elwood Ingle and Joe Orris with him before styling came, became separate and made George Walker finally a vice president in charge of styling. Again, back in those 50s, uh, before product planning came along and started to dictate that things look alike, uh, Fords were very easily distinguished from a GM car. Uh, and in fact, uh, Old Henry really encouraged uh, a lot of uh, continuity in the things that he wanted done, but he wanted it done primarily for the economy of doing it. Uh, but he was interested in uh, uh, engineering and of course the V8 that Ford came out with in 32 that was uh, popularized by Bonnie and Clyde, uh, they could always outrun the law because when they stole cars, they made sure it was a Ford V8, which could outrun the cops easily. But old Henry had sort of no use for styling. He wanted ease of putting them together. And once product planning got their uh, importance, recognized, you had three factions vying for what the final outcome was. Mm -hmm. And engineering could absolutely veto uh, something uh, if they could justify that it cost too much to make it. And in fact, in the process of designing a car, I told you the, my Thunderbird fins got eliminated because they cost too much. And even the way they are manufactured, because that 61 Thunderbird was manufactured at the brand new Wick plant along with the 61 Lincoln. And prominent factor even there was the way they were put together with a uh, 
stainless molding capping the tops of the fenders because the fenders were pinch welded at the top. And those moldings, while they were part of the uh, theme, they were also to cover up the pinch weld. At the time I was there at Ford uh, was the advent of product planning. Product planning built themselves an empire with surveys and focus groups and they later became quite powerful and even partly be because they uh, were able to endorse ideas that none of the executive uh, division people were willing to stick their neck out and be blamed if it failed. Now the Edsel was one thing that happened while I was there. It was uh, the product uh, misguided product planning along with some people who thought that there should be an intermediate brand and uh, frankly I think product planning was a little bit off base even when they named it Edsel because the general public didn't know what a wonderful man Edsel Ford was but but he did in fact old Henry he was blessed with a a name that uh, wasn't exactly automotive sounding. Anyway, that car, as it was evolved, was intended to be at a midpoint uh, between the uh, Mercury and the Lincoln. And uh, the idea of that vertical grill was really not that bad an idea pretty advanced even to have that vertical grill. And there were then a whole series of negative circumstances that compounded put the thing under. First of all, right at that time the uh, mid-price market totally collapsed and even the DeSoto was discontinued because it was in that same exact category because the market for, for those mid-sized cars just vanished. And Ford made the mistake of having highly touted it as going to be something unbelievable and wonderful. The Edsel, the car that is all its classic vertical grille implies, unforgettably original, elegantly styled. And this is a man who's out to drive America's first new major automobile in 19 years. As he slides into the Edsel's comfortable new contour seats, he finds he's in a completely new kind of car with a wonderful new way to drive. For Edsel's exclusive Teletouch drive has taken the push out of buttons. Just a light touch, and the Edsel shifts electrically, safely, while both his hands stay at the wheel. He's feeling that big V8 Edsel engine now, something his Edsel dealer is especially proud of, because the Edsel engines are the newest in the world, and he finds that brake power easily matches horsepower. This is the Edsel. Try out the newest ideas in motoring in the new member of the Ford family of fine cars at your Edsel dealer. When it was introduced, it was different all right, but some people didn't quite think it was uh, in the traditional mode of what a front grille should look like. And kept that all with the fact that uh, Bob Hope on one of his shows made a joke about what the Edsel front end looked like. A sexual innuendo, of course. And on top of that, then in later 
uh, he found out that Edsel jokes were winners. So he started making Edsel jokes. He had a weekly radio program. He started making Edsel jokes, that it looked like a horse collar, and on and on. Different jokes that all of that, with the fact that there was no market for that price category anymore but during that period, that it was even thought to be redundant to the Mercury. So the dealers even were not well equipped and well established. Even the dealer right there in Dearborn was a converted hardware store and even the tiles in the floor were still not finished over with holes where the hardware counters had been. Now this is not how you introduce some great wonder of the world in a semi-converted hardware store. And many, many of the cars came partially unfinished with parts missing. Now why all of that occurred was strictly mismanagement. Uh, A, they should not have even brought it out after the market collapsed. And B, they should have had a decent dealer network and the cars should have been reliable and well finished and they were not. Then the studio manager was in fact practically drummed out of town. They banished him to England because of the disgrace of that failure. McNamara had, he had been brought in to save the company. The Whiz Kids, a group of Air Force officers, were brought in. After the war, the company was in trouble. You know, and they were cranking out B-24s like cars. Every few minutes they were producing a B-24, as well as Jeeps and some other war-related uh, automotive things, trucks and things of that sort. Anyway, the company was really in desperate straits and so HF2 uh, and all the directors uh, decided they needed help. So the whiz, whiz kids came in and some of them became division managers and product managers and so on and McNamara finally became the president. And one of the things that he did as a measure to save the company, he edicted that the 61 Lincoln was to be no more, that the Lincoln brand was finished because the 58, 59, and 60 Lincolns were dismal sales failures. But McNamara said there was to be no more Lincoln. And I told you that Elwood had his competing Thunderbird proposal because they still did not have a Lincoln design, more or less because it was thought to be discontinued. Probably McNamara himself, I'm not totally certain, decided maybe he would give it one more try and he liked Elwood's Thunderbird. Let's make a Lincoln of that Thunderbird that Elwood proposed. That became a very successful car and saved the Lincoln brand, that Thunderbird. And the reason it was so short coupled was because originally it was intended as a Thunderbird and they didn't have time to do a lot of engineering because it was late and they were going to both be produced together simultaneously anyway on the same line. So later, a couple of years later, the Lincoln was lengthened. But the reason for the so-called suicide doors was because with a standard swinging rear door, it was too hard to get your feet in the car because it was so close coupled with a 
with a four-door car. The Thunderbird was a two-door and the Lincoln was a four-door, but the four, the, the opposite opening so-called suicide doors were there not for style, to be able to get in and out. And it became part of the Lincoln look and the whole Lincoln personality. And they even did a four-door convertible with those suicide doors. That 61 Lincoln, again, which started out as a Thunderbird, set a lot of trends. And when Elwood, I told you, jumped ship and went over to Chrysler, some of his first work on Chrysler's had a very strong resemblance to those so-called slab-sided Lincolns. My tenure at Ford was only six years. Two former car designers whom I knew had a business of their own, a design business. They offered me a, a partnership, so I jumped at that. At a Ferrari show, I was approached by the owner of Orange Blossom engagement rings. And again, at that time, there were several uh, major companies making engagement rings. And the owner approached me and he's, he said, you know, our sales have been a little slow recently. You think you could design engagement rings? You've got all this notice for designing all these other things. Can you design engagement rings? Of course I can. So I used headlamp retaining rings and made large scale models and sculpted the designs in clay using the headlamp rings as armatures and came up with half a dozen ideas. I took them to show to him and his immediate reaction was, these are not engagement rings. I said, exactly, they're not engagement rings. Well, for years prior, back into probably 50 years, engagement rings were simple bands, maybe combined in different colors, and maybe three bands with a row of diamonds, small stones, melee between them, but they were all low set. The diamonds were set down in between the bands. That was what engagement rings looked like. And they had, no, I had the salesman, the sales manager brought in his traveling case and it was a big case on wheels, yay tall with drawers pull out these drawers with all these different styles. They all looked the same. They were all alike. And you look at their advertising and it showed a little old worker hunched over the bench with a magnifier working on his design. And the headline was craftsmanship. Our quality is unsurpassed, the way they are made. Well, I told him, the owner, you have nothing to sell that's any different from what all the other people in the industry are selling. And he said, well, that's what engagement rings are. And I said, well, not necessarily. So I persuaded him to have his prototype department make up 12 of my designs in actual size, in actual rings. I had the sales manager take that Samsonite case 
and go out to the various jewelers, some of his bigger accounts, and he came back, no way. They're not engagement rings. We don't want them. They wouldn't buy these. So, because by then, not only was I in a design business, but I was also in the advertising business for all of these aftermarket companies. I did all their advertising and all their catalogs and their product design. And part of my whole premise was that I offered a full total service. And even in designing a product, I knew what were the salient points and what would appeal and how they could be shown and how they could be advertised. Whereas normally a design company didn't do anything but design. An advertising agency didn't do anything but advertise and they farmed out all the various elements that went into making an ad and they sometimes uh, would have outside suppliers that were even regulars with their companies to do their photography and produce their commercials and so on. But part of my whole pitch was that I did the whole thing and from start to finish and therefore my products were more saleable because I knew from the beginning how they were going to be promoted and advertised and to what demographic, what market they would appeal to, to try to design them specifically to fit that end desirable demographic. And a part of that was even my argument with the owner of this engagement ring company. These ads that talked about their quality and their craftsmanship and the quality of the gold that they were using and all of these wonderful attributes as to how they were made, but nothing about what they look like. And obviously, why? Because they all looked alike anyway, and even the competitors looked exactly the same. Everybody had the same look. So, with that in mind, I knew that I could provide to these jewelers a dealer listing which showed their name and their address and their telephone number on a page opposite a full color image of these new styles. Now, again, the little girl doesn't care at all about the little fellow doing all this craftsmanship. She wants to wave her hand in front of her little girlfriends. Look, look what I got. Isn't it pretty? And oh, that ooh and ah had nothing to do with the craftsmanship. It had to do with what it looked like. So, to shorten the story a little bit, the jewelers liked that idea to have their store in a national magazine. And we were using the magazines that all the little girls took and were inspired by as they contemplated getting married. Ingenue and uh, Modern Bride and all the things that they read. So next, the ads broke. And the little girls were coming into the stores, clutching the ad. I have to have that. Oh, I want that. Oh, it's so beautiful. I want that one. The short of it is, and the major, major achievement of it all, the trade papers gave us credit for, quote, revolutionizing an entire industry and furthermore revolutionizing the way they are advertised and sold with style. Engagement rings today look like 
the things that we designed with the flowing shapes and the high set stones rather than the simple bands with stones set low. With Bova doing uh, styling for the watches and including a totally revolutionary design at that time it was called the Accutron. Listen to this. That's the hum of the world's most accurate timepiece, amplified more than 100 times. The new electronic Accutron by Bulova. Designed all of their display material, advertising and store displays, everything. The uh, little cases that hold the watches and uh, everything. So got a lot of notice with that as well. And uh, uh, trade papers gave us credit for uh, revolutionizing an industry with that Accutron. My two partners, you know, in our chatting back and forth, I let them know that I wanted to get to California. So they would allow me to come to California and set up a branch office in California. And, you know, it took a, a while to get the whole thing organized and get it shaped up, but that's what, exactly what I did. I opened a branch office and began to accumulate clients, you know, to operate that office. And finally I had a, a going thing. And after about a year, without any notice, my two partners appeared on my doorstep. They had shut down the Detroit office and come to join me. And come to find out, they were enamored with going to the beach at four o'clock, so they would leave and leave me there to work half the night, keeping the place going. So, final outcome was, and, and we had a corporation, uh, equal shares in the corporation. I gave them the corporation and walked. I left them with the corporation and opened my own company. Took a few of my accounts, but left them with a going business. Uh, and would you know, in less than a year, they went broke and folded it up. So <laughs> my own new company then, uh, because there were no uh, car studios at the time, there was no way I could get car design business. And even uh, when I had initially started the California office, I decided that I had to try to get accounts that were automotive related. So uh, when I started my own company then, I concentrated very heavily on those kinds of accounts. And if you name any of the aftermarket automotive companies, most of them were based in California. A lot of them were startups, but it was becoming, uh, California was really where many, many of those aftermarket companies began. I finally had 32 of the major automotive aftermarket companies were my accounts. Mallory invented the breakerless ignition and in fact, when they first introduced it, it was in a brown cardboard box, and it didn't even make a dent. Nobody had any thought of carrying it in the, and displaying it in their store prominently. They had it on a back shelf somewhere, just because Mallory had uh, other products, high performance products, distributors, and. Uh, coils and other kinds of things. So they would they would have this 
Brickless ignition kit, but made no effort to really display it or make anything important of it. So I f saw the thing and I felt that it was really an innovation that was bound to take over. And of course, breakerless ignition is standard nowadays, but it had not caught on. Uh, and uh, I decided that it had to be shown and advertised and featured as something really quite wonderful. So from the cardboard box, that ain't going to impress anybody. So I went to Vivitar, the local camera, make the small cameras, and they had a, a, a box that they sold these little cameras from. So I bought the tooling for the Vivitar camera box and uh, fitted it out to hold this breakerless ignition kit. And then I started to run ads showing all the benefits of breakerless ignition in quite diagrammatic detail as to how it worked and even what it looked like and why it was better, what were all the terrific advantages of using it and that it would be possible to convert your existing car using this kit. And of course the components were really a couple of little pieces of plastic and uh, uh, the guts transmitted the uh, electronic uh, eye and, uh, and controlled the ignition with a beam of light. It was done with a beam of light. So, you know, you could say the idea that people would latch on to it right away sounds pretty preposterous. How are you going to generate ignition control with a beam of light? So that was, that was the challenge. And of course, the story is legend that immediately, once people caught on to what it was, became hugely successful. And it's how cars are done today. Bill Deer invented the automotive eight-track stereo. At that time, there were no cassette players or anything of that sort. Uh, the eight-track players were the only alternative to a uh, standard radio. And he started uh, several very important companies, and uh, being the mad genius that he was, he went on to the next one, and, and all of them were successful. He was actually selling this unit that, it, that simply had a, it was a box with a horizontal slot in the front of it, and you push the tape in there and it played. And, uh, and I evolved what I called cabinet front styling with uh, wood grain effects and uh, slide controls and even channel selection. Prior to that, you simply put the tape in and it started with the first one and played through all the, the various channels. Lear Astronics was a company that he started and at the time we were working on the then experimental F-16, developing the fly-by-wire flight controls. I was doing, for the ads, for Learstronics, I was doing futuristic airplanes to show symbolically how advanced the things were we were working on. And one day I had a phone call Jim, get over here. We have a big problem. The suits are here. Well, the suits were the DOD, the Department of Defense. And of course, this F-16 uh, 
in itself was what they call a black program. You had to have security clearances. I had top security clearances. And you had to have security to work on all this stuff. They took me in the conference room where there were six of them, suits, and they were ready to send me off to jail for divulging black programs with these uh, futuristic airplanes I was designing and putting in the ads. Of course, they were strictly out of my imagination because the configuration of the F-16 had already been resolved, but I was going beyond that. So after, at least in the few months after that, I had an ad showing an eagle in flight, and my headline was uh, perfection in flight, saying that the eagle was a perfect flying machine, and so were the things we were working on. He named his oldest daughter Shanda. Well, you might say, well, that's, that's not too weird. It's a little unusual. But when you combine that with his last name, what do you get? Shanda Lear. Now, can you imagine this girl going through life with a name Chandelier. There must have been constant jokes about whether her light was on or, or just what all. The business, as I evolved it, soon added to the car accounts related things, hobby and model kit companies. The major fire of, of model kits was Ravel. And I took that account and made them number one in America. There were several other similar businesses, Monogram, and there were others, but I made Ravel number one in the period that I had that. Number one Cadillac dealer on the west side of LA is Martin Cadillac. And I got that account at the time when automobiles were downsized and Cadillac had even done some foolish things uh, like the 864 which was a total dud, total failure and even to try to sell these downsized Cadillacs and still talk about image was not that easy. You had to convince people it was still a luxurious wonderful automobile. And even in my radio commercials, where all the other car dealers were doing shouting, come in today, we got $99 discount. We have all these models and styles you could ever, ever, ever want. We have a lot full. Come on down. And their newspaper ads look like grocery store ads with big prices and big headlines. So. I started to do very refined, tasteful kinds of ads. And then in this case, I was able to do quarter page ads in the sports section with very totally foreign to what other car ads were. And in the sports section yet, a quarter page, small ad. Well, in the LA Times, even a quarter page was twenty thousand dollars you know so we're not talking about peanuts and uh, part of my approach was to try to imply this luxurious different place to come and buy a Cadillac and as in addition to the ads my radio commercials were also very confidential, very soft-spoken. More for your car, less for ours, with hundreds of brand new 1980 Cadillacs to choose from. So come in while there's still time. And remember, you are important to us. Respectfully, Martin Cadillac. Became the number one Cadillac dealer in America. And I got an award 
for the best dealer advertising in America for 1980. Powers did packaging and product design for Max Factor, including incense burners. The Royal Regiment men's line was extremely popular. To do a digital readout for clocks requires a very large drum. Powers came up with the idea of flip cards, which allows a very large readout. Powers did private label clocks for many stores and had the designs patented. Powers designed the new Sports Coach motorhome outside and inside. Sports Coach quickly became the best seller in America. Procision had a finely detailed line of auto control cars. The packaging used transparent windows to view the wonderful detail of the cars. Zemco had a full line of electronics, from alarms to driving controls. Montessa produced motorcycles, and Torque and Cyclone had parts and exhaust components for cycles. Powers did advertising for Car King's full line of car covers. Powers did packaging and advertising for Cal Custom Horns, Alarms, and Driving Lights. He also developed test instruments that could be mounted or handheld. This is the power pack for emergency starting with a dead battery. Powers introduced Yokohama tires into this country with a small budget that only allowed two color ads. He developed a process that made the ads seem to have full color. Keystone Wheels was the largest aftermarket wheel company. Powers even designed the wheels as well as the advertising. This ad for Cyclone mufflers was in the mode of teenage recognition. Cal Chrome was another wheel account. Ampion Lee had a full line of automotive aftermarket products. Powers did all the advertising, even design. High performance tires ads were designed to appeal to young people. These ads produced instant response from that demographic. Bell Helmets was the leading maker of helmets for racing and more casual use, such as cycling. Powers did promotions in addition to the advertising. Willem B. Hahn had a mail order business as well as a retail store. He made regular buying trips to Italy to obtain merchandise that could not be found elsewhere. This is a Speed Age magazine cover featuring Powers' advanced design. Powers used small black and white ads showing the reduced prices for Elegons and One Day Paint and Body. These ads were very successful. McLean, with many other products, also had this high-end lawnmower. Swede 55 produced high-speed racing yachts. Powers did this packaging for Isuzu for sale in their dealerships. Rotex made commercial label makers as well as those for private use. Powers designed the label maker including unique packaging which showed the different colored tapes. This was a display of collector's car badges for the Olympics. Powers designed an orange peeler and many in-store promotions for sun-kissed growers. This is one of a series of pet products done for Car Nation. The star Kissed label designed by Powers and used the iconic Charlie Tuna. O.J. Simpson owned all the honey-baked ham franchises. Powers designed for him a banquet in a box to try and level out the traditional holiday sales. Powers designed a complete new image for Jade West's Oriental Restaurant. Powers used the very sophisticated approach for ads for Gucci. These ads were used all around the country. Morris Carr, an exclusive men's clothier, used these very tailored ads. These ads were for Joseph Magnan. They were in contrast to the usual department store ads, sophisticated and sparse. They were in the tone of sophisticated young women. Mike Caruso's ad showed a nostalgia that people were attracted to. COA made expensive ophthalmologic tests and prescribing equipment. Conrack made high-performance color monitors for use in industry and private applications. This is the catalog for the American Hall of Aviation History.
Powers bought a mid-century office building. The building was a real treat since he could have his cars in the lower part. He always said even Jay Leno had to go to a warehouse where Powers could simply go downstairs. I began to collect cars probably the time I was in Art Center. Once you collect them, you fall in love with them and don't want to sell them. So now they even end up my children. I had submitted to Jack Telhack, who was the vice president of design at that time, my, he asked me to submit my proposals for the O2 Thunderbird. This was in 1998. My Thunderbird proposals were not accepted, even though Telnac had begun to, to do some work using my proposals. But at that time, he retired, and Jay Mays took over. Jay Mays claimed to fame as the round Audi and the uh, latter-day Volkswagen, which is also very round. So he made the Thunderbird round and, to my eye, fat. And it was, in fact, a total sales dud. And uh, here again, like the Edsel, it was highly touted and people expected something really exciting and wonderful and here it is, basically a blob. And they didn't sell. It was unfortunate because people expected something really exciting from Thunderbird and again, particularly because they had made so much noise about how exciting and wonderful and forward advanced it was to be and then a dud and uh, again some management uh, mistakes uh, to my eye. So I did this modified kit which could be added without any body work called Power Sport. You'll see this tonneau cover with the fairings, the special wheels, and the front end cap, which is attached over the original, what I called a chic shaver front end, to give it a nice, more aggressive mouth shape. And I added the nostril hood scoop. The tail lamp lenses are actually from a Volkswagen, which fortunately fit very nicely into the shape. It is still available as a kit. And in conjunction with my Thunderbird designs, I also proposed a baby Continental, a baby Lincoln, which would take advantage of the tooling and all of the basic running gear for the Thunderbird and simply put a new skin on it and therefore, at a minimal cost, have a baby Lincoln, which would be a halo car. They had pretty well allowed Lincoln to uh, languish without spending any money on it indicated publicly that they are going to try to now bring Lincoln back. You know, it has really been neglected for so long that Cadillac and even the foreign makes, Mercedes and BMW, have taken its place. The show car is uh, a one-of-a-kind that is developed as the name indicates to appear in uh, uh, major auto shows, the New York Auto Show and the Detroit Auto Show. Detroit Auto Show was called the 
uh, U.S. International Auto Show. So they show these uh, advanced concepts to get public reaction primarily. Many times they were refined and uh, made into production some or some features from them. They were always destroyed for legal reasons uh, because uh, normally they were uh, hand-built and jerry-rigged uh, with, without any testing. So if you uh, had a crash and killed someone, you'd be legally responsible for selling that. And that's why they were normally crushed. And the, uh, even with the General Motors show cars, there was one particular uh, junkyard where they took them to have them crushed. And the guy who ran the uh, junkyard uh, hid them away. His name in Chicago, I think he has a lot of them now, that he's put away and uh, has saved. And now they're super valuable. But there was uh, one of the Ford uh, show cars, concept cars, that I bought. And they had even disabled a lot of the, uh, the features uh, and even to park it at a show. You had to get up under the front bumper and, and pull on a lever that uh, clamped a, a valve in the brake lines and that kept it stationary. Uh, the brakes inside the pedal brakes in the car didn't function. And all of the uh, transmission uh, gear selectors, the, the various uh, shift points were not operational. It was all uh, for show, for the design, the look of it. But they didn't function uh, onto the transmission. And since I got it, I made the brakes operable and I took off all of the styling console and reworked it because it actually had a, uh, an automatic transmission there, but it had all been covered up and disconnected and so I made it, redesigned it and made it workable. The reason I had to have it was because the concept car that I bought was a part of at least the inspiration of my proposal for a baby Lincoln. This is the Lincoln Mark X concept car, one of a kind. It was originally uh, inspired by a proposal that I did as a uh, Thunderbird uh, counterpart. This is a 1960 Cadillac. It recently has won many awards. The 1960 Cadillac, in my view, was the best expression of the tail fins that were current at that time. These tail fins, even though they're quite substantial, are done very gracefully and tastefully. This is a 1967 Buick. This and the 67 Eldorado next to it were at the very peak of Bill Mitchell's reign at General Motors. Uh, they share body components and a lot of styling. This is a 67 Eldorado, part of the same series at General Motors. This is a 65 Buick Riviera. 
And this one is the Grand Sport, which means that this one has the high performance engine and uh, a more deluxe treatment. You'll notice the front end, which I particularly like, the headlamps are concealed and even open clamshell effect in the front. This 65, again, was probably one of the nicest road of that era and again was a very uh, uh, high point of Bill Mitchell's work at General Motors. This is a 67 Cougar. Uh, the Cougar, of course, was a highly modified version of the Mustang with all new body, but utilizing much of the inner structure of the Mustang. This is a Firebird, and again, the front end of this car really strikes me as quite wonderful with the uh, twin nostril grill and even the uh, almost aircraft canopy look of the roof. 66 Toronado. Uh, it happens to have two steering wheels. Uh, the, that would really make it qualify as a driver training car. But some people may stand and look for a while before they notice that this car is really only half a car against a mirror. <laughs> It was uh, not an easy thing to do uh, because uh, you'll notice that all the weight and all the structure is outboard and when I cut it I had problems even with the roof collapsing uh, and only because it's against the mirror does the roof hold up. Of course it has no uh, frame or inner structure, it's put on a plywood structure underneath. This is a Jaguar E-Type, which many people consider one of the most beautiful cars ever designed. And the hood is a clamshell. Of course, I completely redid all of the engine compartment and you'll notice that uh, it's quite handsome, quite wonderful. This car, of course, along with most of them, has won uh, awards. This is a Ford GT. 05, which is a reproduced version of the winning Le Mans race car. You may have heard the story that Ford was about to buy Ferrari and Ferrari backed out and that triggered Ford to produce the winning GT show cars. The door opens into the roof. That was done strictly for race purposes so the driver was able to get in and out more quickly. I bought this car new. The list price was $150,000 and since then it has tripled in value. This one's even more unique because it has only 100 miles on it and the stripe delete uh, I was able to arrange directly from Ford because I felt it was more handsome 
without the stripes. There's again more story about this one than some of the others. Okay. Chrysler was in dire financial shape. Lee Iacocca went to Chrysler and at that point he only took one dollar a year salary. So his personal car he went to a dealer and bought this car rather than taking a company car. And you'll see that this car has all of the Frank Sinatra tapes all in a console. This was his personal car. And I have every piece of paper ever related to this car, including his title, his insurance papers with his signature, the punch cards, factory build punch cards, the factory build sheet, and even the window sticker. The diamond hood ornament has been replicated in this cut glass ignition key. This is a Ferrari 308 GTB. However, when the 308 was sent into this country, they all had big heavy bumpers. You'll see that on this particular car, I've totally removed the bumper and put grill work, which I liberated from a Toyota, but you'll see that the grill shape itself is very attractive and works very nicely without the bumper. This is an Acura NSX. It was, of course, very well received by the motoring press and deservedly so, because uh, back then it could probably be compared to some of the later day supercars. It was a high performer rear engine car and I particularly like the styling of the canopy because I think it has a jet aircraft look about it. This car is a Stutz Bearcat, well known as the favorite of the Rat Pack. The Rat Pack uh, were uh, known for exotic special cars, and it was very expensive. It was made in Italy, though it had Pontiac running gear. The wood trim in the doors is not a vinyl replica, it's actual wood. You'll notice that the spare tire is mounted on the deck. 77 Stutz Spare Cat. This is a 56 Lincoln Premier. I bought one new back in 56, and when I saw a Mark II, I had to have a Mark II, so I sold my six-month-old Lincoln Premier to get a Mark II. This one, of course, I've acquired later, but I particularly like the uh, buttercup yellow interior with the black. I think this car uh, is, in fact, one of the most beautiful cars ever done. Very simple. Uh, in uh, 57, uh, as happens many times with facelifts, they messed it up with putting the fins on it. This is my Mark II. This car I got all the way back when I was at Ford 
in 56. I used it as a daily driver for many years. It wants to go fast, but it doesn't want to go stop. A lot of people have since modified them and put different brakes on them, but the car uh, had a, a frame under it like a railroad train, and you uh, go over bumps and you only have a little thump. This one, of course, is the one that I did the original design concept. You can see that it's very original, and even the, uh, the interior is almost unused. Every part of it is like new. This car I showed at Palos Verdes, and it won first in class. This car is a 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado, and the design was considered totally revolutionary, and in fact, initially, it was not well received, but later, even today, many cars are imitating these heavy wheel openings, and the very wide greenhouse with the curved glass, all of those things were totally unique at that time. This car I've had probably 30 years, and initially I found it uh, more or less deserted in an alley, and uh, it, because I enjoyed it so much, it became my daily driver and it's only recently that it's been restored. This is a 1970 Thunderbird, and I was particularly enamored with the bird beak, the way the nose stands out. And you'll notice the, uh, the license plate even tells you what it is, a 70 T-Bird. This is a DeLorean. I knew John DeLorean, and in fact, when the Italians designed this car, it was very revolutionary. The skin has a very unique and sometimes a difficult to take care of quality about it. Uh, DeLorean came to me and said he did not like the wheels that the Italians had done. He had me design the wheels. This car, among other features, has a lift-up door. This is a Corvette Stingray. It has a transparent see-through top. Uh, I modified it uh, to extend the silver body color along the sides while I still maintain the see-through on the top itself. And I've, I felt that the styling on this car was very advanced, very exciting. This car is my current daily driver, it's a 96 Lincoln Continental, and personally I feel that the styling of this car is even much nicer than most anything that's on the road today. I particularly like the interior of this car. It almost has a cockpit-like uh, enclosure around the driver. A 1947 Lincoln Continental. Uh, the, this really was an absolute standout back in the day. And you see the tire mounted on the back, 
was where the term Continental Kit really originated. This car is a 1961 Lincoln Continental four-door convertible, absolutely unique at the time, and still very much imitated by the things that are done today. This car was originally designed as a 1961 Thunderbird by Elwood Engel. And in fact, it sold so well that it really saved the Lincoln brand. This is a 1972 Mark IV. It has less than 2,000 miles. And in fact, even more rare, it has the nylon interior, which we called panty cloth because it was sheer and soft. And of course, though, was very fragile. So uh, most of them are long ago deteriorated. This is Aston Martin, made famous by James Bond. And later, I've seen many copies or versions of what other people felt were good design elements. It can also be termed as a very special custom car. It's actually a 07 is what it is. They did not build very many of them. They were very rare. This is a Lamborghini, a Lamborghini Murcielago. I particularly enjoy this car because of the very beautiful streamlined design. And of course, it is categorized as a supercar because it's very powerful, travels at high speeds, and of course, has the swing up doors. These wings raise at high speed to generate airflow to the rear engine and a uh, better aerodynamic effect. The later uh, versions of Lamborghini are much more contrived and have really gone beyond the simplicity and the nice, simple style of this car. I belong to, um, to many car clubs and uh, always interested in finding new things. Uh, I think that car design now, after, been, uh, after being pretty stale in the last couple of decades has begun to show some imagination. So I'm excited about what's happening with car design now.